party. And the part, and I, I told people that it wasn't the Panthers that made me join the Black Panther Party. It was the police department in New York right. City yeah. with their racist attitudes that made me join the Black Panther Party. Yeah. You know? So when they, they approached me about being a militant and being a Panther and being a member of the Black Liberation Movement, I told them straight up that you did it. Because I would have never done it if the, by listening to the Panthers, but listening, watching you with my own eyes and what you were doing to doing made me listen to what they were saying. So if you got a problem with me being militant and a Panther, then you should look at what you're doing. If you change your ways, then there wouldn't be a need for me to be militant. And anyway, when I joined, when I, before I actually went and joined, I called my mother and my father up at home. It was the actual day incident. We ended up my karate sister again. We out there in the streets again, down 42nd Street and Times Square. We were coming down from 8th Avenue to 7th Avenue, and we saw this great crowd of people in the pants on the corner selling papers. And, uh, and a little education can be dead, deadly. It can be real deadly. Because um, we saw them selling papers, and this cop was harassing us for selling papers. So stupid me, I really thought that he understood the Constitution. <laughs> so stupid me, I said to the cop, he has a constitutional right to sell, disseminate political literature. Now, I didn't say sell papers, I said disseminate political literature. And, you know, so he's standing on his constitutional right. Man looked at me and said, uh, give me your ID. He wanted my ID, I gave him my ID. He told me to get up against the car, told me I was uh, interfering, I was obstructing governmental process, I was inciting a riot, and I was doing all this because I was telling him that I told him simply, and I didn't do it loudly, I just told him that this Panther was, had a constitutional right to sell those papers. He arrested me, my friend, and the Panther, put us, handcuffed us, put us in the back of the car, and drove us to the 14th precinct. And I learned on the way to the 14th precinct that there's no such thing as a constitutional right where it comes to black people. So that was a clear cut for me to dress Scott decision all over again that a black man, a woman has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. They didn't have to teach me that lesson again. When they got to the precinct, they told us they would hold court in the precinct. They were going to take us to court. They did the whole strip search routine, the, all the, the works. And this was the first time I'd ever been arrested for anything. By the time I left that precinct, that day, I, before I left, I called my mother and told my father to meet me at the house because I had something to tell them. I had decided I was joining the Black Panther Party. I had decided that I was going to, from that point on, that I was going to dedicate my life to making sure that I would never again be treated as a second class citizen. That I would never again be submitted to the humiliation that they did based on me believing in their constitutional work for us. And my mother told me that uh, if I believe in what you're doing, go ahead. And from that day forward, I've been a member of the Black Liberation Movement. It wasn't easy. Um, I went back to the Panther office, and the first thing they did was throw a whole bunch of books on me and told me I had to study. Because, one, that education, in order to, be, to liberate yourself, you have to free your mind. That you have to learn how to educate and organize. And you have to learn the three main rules of discipline and eight points of attention. Because freedom without discipline is void. And uh, so, where they talked about the party, the members of the Black Panther Party being thugs and criminals and, and uh, all that other stuff. Before the party allowed you to become a member, you had to go through all this educational process. Before you were allowed out there to organize in the community, you had to understand what our position was. You had to stay understand how to work with the people. You had to understand that you're supposed to, not only did you work with the people, but you respected the people in the community. You respected the elders in the community. You, you, you're out there as defenders of the community and protectors of the people in the community. And so, and when we talked about the part of the Black Panther Party of self defense, we, we did that kind of work in the community. We fed the people, we educated, all these organized, and you, and disseminate literature, you were responsible for making sure, and you have to prove that they gave me a section, they gave me a section meeting, they gave me a section that I had to organize, and I had to make sure that everyone, that those people in that section where I worked in, knew everything that was going on. 
And that section had, was my base in the community. So if I needed refuge in the community, I could go into my section and those people in that community were there for to hide, defend, and to protect me. It was a cop, it was a, uh, each one protecting the other situation. And I, that training and that section, when the police began, came to look for me, and uh, with the subpoenas after I went underground, I was able to go back into that same community that I was used as my section. And those people, the old people in that community, those those elders were the ones that hid me till I was able to make it out of New York City. <laughs> so that 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 base area, that what you're organizing area, was also the area that defended and protected you. So it was a reciprocal thing. Um in nineteen it was 1969, in November of 69, when I joined the party. By 1971, now, one of the things I want to be very clear about, the party was not uh, perfect. Whenever, any time that you have organization rising and becoming as strong and as internationally known as quickly as the party did, with a bunch of youth, because the majority of the members of the Black Council Party were young people. <laughs> And young youth, uh, what goes along with youth is impatience. And a lot of um, egos developed because the media was always there and the white man was already there, always there with the money and the handouts and all the stuff that you were not used to. And so a lot of incorrect things went down within the Black Panther Party. Not because the rules and regulations of the party was incorrect, because the people in the party allowed liberalism and egos to become more important than the principles that we were we were supposed to be dealing with. And because hero worship became a very important element in the Black Panther Party, people, because Huey said it, or Bobby said it, or Elder said it, or any of them said it, you couldn't question it. Whereas the principles were right there and it gave you the guide for how you're supposed to deal with it. The party was supposed to be a democratic centralist organization, and those things went by the way because these quote unquote leaders said something, do something, or they did something, and they justified it by saying that we lead it. Or because we are the, we, we created and we started it. And we are more important than the individual. And it's not so. It is not so. One of the things that was very that should have been clear and we should understand is that the struggle was more important than the individual in the struggle. The people and as an advance in the struggle was more important than any individual and an organization, which is very necessary for a struggle to move from one level to the other, was definitely more important than the individual. And that got turned around because of liberalism. Now, by 1971, there was so much internal bickering in the party and then so much um, deviation from principles that there there was a split in the Black Panther Party. But in this, while we were going with that internal contradiction, that fratricide, that the government through COINTELPRO was, was souping up and would make it move more and more, we were also dealing with the, uh, the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, making moves to defend and, uh, 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 the community and members of the party against the aggression that the state was actually putting forth on us. Because, and um, in New York alone, we had the state moving, the police brutality had risen to such a height that um, in less time than one year, we had Clifford Glover, Ricky Bowden, and more and more youth being just killed, out and out murdered in the streets of New York. Um, there was no way as principal people and as revolutionaries that the BLA members of the party could sit back and not make a move to defend the community and to get the police off the backs of our community. While we were dealing with our internal contradictions, we had a principled responsibility to protect our community because we had put ourselves out there as defenders of the community. And there was no way as people who were dedicated to our community that we could allow this to happen. So we were fighting three struggles simultaneously. We were fighting the struggle in our community with each other to, to, to actually be involved in an armed struggle. We were fighting the struggle with the internal contradictions within the party, and we were fighting the struggle 
with the, the, the enemy themselves. That struggle led to the demise of the Black Panther Party. That struggle that we were fighting, those three struggles at once, also led to the isolation of the Black Liberation Army and the death of, in two or three years' time, at least 13 members of the Black Liberation Army. And the arrest, capture, and conviction of all the, and uh, of two or three scores more members of the Black Liberation Army coast to coast. And the majority of those people are still in prison now. When the Black Liberation Army, one of, one, let, I'm going to backtrack a minute to talk about the Black Liberation Army itself. The Black Liberation Army didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, at that time, through historical ignorance, I believe that the Black Liberation Army was the military arm of the Black Panther Party. Because when I came into the party, one of the 26 rules of the Black Panther Party was that no party member can join any other armed force other than the Black Liberation Army. So it was understood that if, if you were to engage in military activity, that the, the, through the, um, the armed force through which you engaged in it was the Black Liberation Army. It wasn't until, so I joined the Black Liberation Army on one five two going underground to liberate an, uh, one cell of it to work on the liberation of POWs. And that was the Harry Tubman Brigade or and the, uh, the underground, underground Railroad as we back and forth called ourselves. That unit, particular unit of the Black Liberation Army. Um, before um, Twyman Myers, who was one of the uh, members of that particular unit when that unit was formed, and Clive Twyman Myers was since assassinated by the New York State Police and the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, working in concert. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, I ended up, the, I was told by the um, body that I should remain underground and deal with political work, revoke, re 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 remain above ground, because it was necessary for someone to make sure the offices of the Black Panther Party remain open and the political work kept going on. Because the people needed somewhere to go to to get information. And we needed, the political apparatus was what the military apparatus needed to depend on to make sure the correct information was gotten out about what they were doing. The, um, in 1973, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, they were culminated their um, investigation of the Bad Panther Party and the BLA with a bunch of subpoenas. And one of the things, and a grand jury was sitting to um, take evidence against the BLA and the BPP. That grand jury issued a subpoena to about two dozen people at one time. They were just doing blanket subpoenas. One of the subpoenas they issued, which was different from the subpoenas they did to others, was to me, and that subpoena was, came with total immunity from prosecution. What that meant was, if I appeared before the grand jury, I could not take the Fifth Amendment because they had already granted me immunity. Um, I had to make a decision about going before the grand jury or not. I knew I couldn't testify before the grand jury. There was no way I could testify before the grand jury about the BPP and the BLA. Um, we, again, I again uh, had conferences with members of the organization and the decision was made that I couldn't go before the grand jury. Because with the, the um, immunity, if I refused to, I, took, I still refused to answer the question, I was facing incarceration. And there were two kinds of um, contempt, if you're on contempt. There are two kinds of contempt. It could have been a civil contempt or felony contempt. With the felony contempt, I, was, I would face one to four for each question I refused to answer. With the civil contempt, I faced 30 days. The civil contempt would come if I just didn't show. The felony contempt would come if I went and I refused to answer questions. So to me, it made more sense not to go, period. So at that point, I was on the ground. In 19, January 1975, I was captured in a shootout in Norfolk, Virginia. 
where one of my, I had two bodyguards. One was named is Alpha Butler, slave named Alpha Butler. Um, his name was Kamboli Amistad. Um, the other's name was Masai Yehose, slave named William Gibson. Um, we were captured on our way to, we were actually on our way to Florida. And um, when they captured us in the, uh, in, the, in the shootout, they said that, well, they, they killed Kambozi straight up. Um, Kambozi was, um, this is over here, a curious Sana E. Jose's uh, brother. Um, Masai is her husband now. So <laughs> we didn't even meet her until after we came home from prison. But it was just such a loop that one of the things that we wanted to do from the time we got it captured to the time we got home was to make contact with that family to let them know about Kambozi. Because when they, when, when they captured, when the shootout went down, it was not like they had been surveilling us. We didn't know we were under surveillance. They had infiltrated a collective that we had um, infiltrated the party in New York. They had, um, there was one brother, his name was, um, um, I can't remember his name now, but he was, he turned out to have been a Gold Shield detective, major crime unit in the New York Police Department. And, um, in the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we were in Virginia, a phone call came into the, to where I was staying at saying that they had heard that I had been captured in a, sh in a bank robbery in, in Virginia. Now, there was no bank robbery in Virginia. I was standing right next to the phone when the phone call came in. So, but then what that told us is that they knew we were in Virginia. So that very night, we made preparations to leave Virginia. And um, when the sh we, one of the things, we went to, to a store to find, to make sure we got everything we needed so we wouldn't have to stop at roadside restaurants and stores because one of the things, um, that we had learned from other people's happened to other people that were in the underground was that cops and state troopers frequent those store, those places you stop on the side of the road. So one of the things we didn't want to do was make those kind of stops. Um, that particular night when we left the house in Norfolk to go get cold cuts and stuff like that to make sandwiches so we could have food in the car while we were traveling and stuff like that, a dude who never before and offered us any support, offered us the use of his car so we can go shopping. Hmm. Which we should have thought was strange, but we didn't. Um, when we got to this particular place where we were going shopping at, when we walked through, the, when I walked, I told them to stay in the car, I walked into the store and walked past, and I just noticed that there one of the people were in the back on the phone. When I went on back in uh, the shop, and I uh, happened to look up, Kambozi and Masai was coming through the door. When they came through the door, the store man had a shotgun pointed at the door. Next thing I heard was gunfire. Um, the thing happened so quickly that all I could think was I m went to pull my weapon. Uh, Kambozi earlier that night, Kambozi had asked me, because I had a federal firearm submit. One of the things that I stressed very, because I had never had a felony conviction. Uh, for anything, and if you don't have a felony conviction, you can get a legal, legal, a license to carry arms. And um, so I had had a federal firearms permit, I think, to carry long arms, and I had bought a paratrooper and one with a folding stock across the counter. I called her Josephine. Would you explain how you get the federal firearms permit? Uh, you go down to the firearms control board. Um, I have, you a license. Have a. I have a license, but that doesn't give you a permit to uh, carry it on the You can carry it in the open. You can't carry it concealed. <laughs> With the license? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I used to carry it down through the streets of Harlem <laughs> to the office, leave it out in the open. <laughs> and if, when I had press conferences about Bill, you could always see it. It was legal. So they would hype up stuff by saying you carried weapons, but what they didn't tell people is that you were licensed to carry. Right. Someone had been killing me, and uh, 
We 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 were it was then it was a unit. It was a unit of the BLA. Okay. I had two two of the people in the unit act as my personal bodyguard and there were other people in the unit. One of the things that um that we never discussed was who were the other people in the unit because they were never captured. So it was never any need to discuss the other people in the unit. The unit that we belonged to was called the Amistad Collective of the Black Federation Army. Uh, we took it after St. Hugh um, and our motto was until victory we will not retreat a single inch and we will be heard. Frederick Douglass. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we thought that everything we do had to have a political significance. And as long as we had a political significance and we understood what we were about, we had the discipline in our unit, everybody knew their responsibility, Everybody knew that there were certain things that were not allowed in the unit. There was no drinking while you were on duty. There was no drugs, period. At R and R, one of the things we had learned from mistakes of the past was you cannot continuously in, engage yourself in, in struggle without peers of R and R because you have burnout, and burnout is very bad. So you needed to. So we had R and R peers of R and R, and when you were on R and R, you could drink, but you could not do it when you were on duty. Um, there was an attempt to make sure that there were, um, there was no w unit that didn't have at least two women in the unit so that a woman didn't get isolated by not having another woman to com communicate with. The, um, that um, it didn't get so super macho because there were no women in there. So you don't get that uh, Humphrey Bogart approach to struggle. Um, hey, those are real things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the real um, I was a unit coordinator of the Armistad Collective of the Black Liberation Army. We also had known that if we had already went through the drill, it, we never dealt with an, uh, uh, an operation without knowing how to, go, how to go in, how to go out, the escape routes. We didn't deal with an operation without knowing the, um, if you committed a particular act, what were the consequences. So if a person understood when they got down what could come out of it if they got caught, then they could make a conscious decision about whether they wanted to be involved in the first place. And if you made a conscious decision about whether you wanted to be involved, then you were prepared to take the repercussion, the, the, um, assume the repercussions of what happened. Then too, once we had got to that far, then we knew that if we got captured, that we were going to take the, uh, the position of prisoners of war. We were in our particular unit, the Amistad Collective, all of us were citizens of the Republic of New Africa. We had um, determined that we, because the United States, as the prisoners of war, as members of the Black Liberation Army, members of the Armistad Collective, that the government of the United States had no right or no jurisdiction to try us. If captured, we would take, um, an, um, uh, give name, rank, and serial number only. So from the very beginning of our, ca when we were captured on January 25th, 1975, um, actually, I was captured. Kambozi was stopped to death and killed. And they tr attempted, made the attempt to, and I watched him die in front of my, my eyes. I watched him stop him to death. They didn't know he was, he was carrying, he had asked me, could he carry my, the paratrooper one because he just, you know, because he wanted to carry it. And I told him he could. And he had it, he was wearing a military jacket, um, full length, double breast button all the way down and Josephine was in a, under his coat on this side. So there was no way that to determine whether he was packing or not. Um, I, in my pocketbook, I had, we had been training, they had been training me in the, in the, in the um, how to build, make fragmentation grenades using pipe bombs and stuff that, to make pipe bombs. And they had been trained and I had um, about 900 rounds of ammunition in my bag and I had a detective special and those uh, two pipe bombs. Um, I didn't, I had forgot the pipe bombs in there because it was the day before that I had to, was doing, being trained on that. But, and so I knew the round ammo was in there. Um, when Kambozi, they, they didn't know I was in the back of the store, but they knew that Kambozi and Matt, they 
cut them when they were coming in the door. One of the things that we have been taught was that when you're in, in the underground, you, your whole attempt was to assimilate in the surroundings. So you didn't run around the street looking like the, com, the, the uh, big combat machine coming down. So I was dressed like everybody else on the street. You know, I was looking like any old sister on the block. So when I walked through the door, um, they didn't, they just thought I was into the shop, which I was really doing. When composing them came to the door, apparently by, by that time they had the word that, that they were coming into that particular store and they just opened fire when they walked through the door. Composer came down the aisles of where I, where I was, the uh, coat still closed and everything. He had never made an attempt to pull a weapon, but he had, he had kept telling me, as a matter of fact, we had two or three exchanges and he told me that he had been shot and I didn't believe him because I didn't see his weapon drawn. And there was, I couldn't, you know, for a minute there, in that exchange, I couldn't understand how he could be shot and he didn't draw his weapon. But then when I realized I was stupid sitting there arguing with him about whether he was shot or not, he should know whether he was shot. And I told him to lay on the floor and that's when I went to pull my weapon to, to take the fire and, and deal with him. When I went to do that, Masai got shot in the face and he stumbled back out the door. And uh, I saw that happen simultaneously. But the firing was so extensive, it was like a scene out of a Vietnam War movie. Um, Masai came back into the door to try to get us out again. And um, I told him, I motioned to him to go back. Because by this time, the whole situation, I knew that they didn't know who I was. So I think the next one, I already saw that Kambozi, so the thought in my mind was to get help for Kambozi. So I put my weapon down, because they still hadn't noticed that I was there, that I was connected with the two of them. I put my weapon down and attempted to make, uh, make them, to get help for Kambozi, make them realize that he was shot and that he needed help. But what happened was, they came around, the store was surrounded at this point, they came around and the store, the son of the store owner, with the weapon in his hand, came to Kambozi, turned him over his foot, and started stomping on him. And they stomped on him till his eyes went back, and then when he stomped on him the second time, he said, oh, he's got a gun. And that's when they opened up his coat and took the paratrooper M1 off him and threw it into the vegetable bin, and then they started stomping on him some more. And he, they stomped on him till his eyes went back in his head. And, um, and I'm, I'm, he was dead. I knew he was dead. And uh, then we went, I told them, that's when I started playing another role. I told them that um, my mother didn't know where I was and I needed to call my mother and I needed to go and let her know where I was and I needed to make a phone call. He let me out and I figured if I needed to get out the store to try to get away to let somebody know what was happening. Um, when I got out of the store, on the way to the front, the front to the back, they told me I could go make the phone call. And on the way from the front to the back, I started emptying my, my pocketbook of ammunition. Because by the time I got into the phone book, right outside the store, I had, I left two whole packs of rounds of ammunition, boxes of ammunition in the phone booth. The, the store was surrounded. I called New York. When I was telling you about that section, that was my organizing section, there was this little old lady, she was about 40 years old. Now this was, I was like 20, 24 at the time. I was made 25 that year. This little old lady named Mamie Manning, I called her. This sister, she might have been more than 44 because she'd been, her and Billy Holiday had hung together in Harlem. So she might have been, she definitely must have been more than 44. I called her at home and I told her that I was in the process of being arrested. And that I wanted her to call my mother and let her know what was happening so that she wouldn't have to watch it on the television, hear about it from the television. I told her I wanted to call and I gave her the number to a contact person within the movement, let them know that we were getting arrested so that everybody could make a move so they could move so they, if they happened to torture us to get any information, they wouldn't be able to bust anybody else. This old, little old sister in my section made that phone call. She did everything I told her to do. And so that nobody, in nowhere else in the country, in the underground, was able to get a case as a result of us getting arrested, captured in Norfolk, Virginia. And that was the result of us organizing door to door in the community and establishing base areas in the community. Um, the next thing I went 
and I went back into the store because I looked around to see whether or not I could get out. I saw another member unit of the collective, another member of the collective, they were casing to see whether there was a way to, they can get us out without any casualties. And, um, and I went back into the store. Um, when I went back in, I figured that I could still play the role. I could still play the role because they still hadn't connected me with the two of them. I went, when I went back inside, um, I, by this time I had perfected my role. I told them my name was Beverly Dunlap. I told them I was from going to college in, in Connecticut. I told them that I was on spring break. And I needed to, um, and that was the only reason I was in Virginia, was on spring break. But I was ready to go home, because this was enough for me. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they were going for it. Up until here comes Detective Hemingway from, and he came in with a t tuck on, apparently they had contacted them at home. And he came in, took my pocketbook away, and found the two pipe bombs. When he walked into the store, he knew who I was. Was there anybody else in the store? There was a white college student from ODU. And they didn't No. There was the two, the owners of the store, who had opened fire. And there was just myself and Kabozi. When they opened fire on us, when, when he took, he took my pocketbook and found the two pipe, uh, the pipe bombs in there, he said that was enough enough for him to take me into custody. But he'd also, by the, the fact that he came in and just came straight to me and took my pocketbook, that told me he there was the jig was up. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So he took me, told me they took me out and took me and put me into the police car and um Cal uh and but again two other members of the unit walked past and passed the police car and I told them I, I signaled to them to keep going. And uh, when we got down to the precinct, they proceeded to, the next thing the test that Hemingway did was to call New York and told them they had me. They didn't ask me who I was, asked no questions, said nothing to me, but to call to New York and told them they had me. In the room that they took us in, they had BLA members' pictures all over the, ro all over the room, wall to wall, nothing but members, pictures of members of the BLA that were on, they, they were looking for. They had attempted to tell me that uh, Kambozi was still alive. They said they were charging me with two counts of attempted murder and two counts of attempted unrobbery. robbery. And that um, they were, Virginia had the felony murder room and they still had the death penalty <coughs> also at the time. And the felony murder room said that if anyone is killed in a while of time a felony is being committed that you have the responsibility and it's a death penalty charge. So then they said that, that if Kamosi died that they were going to give me a felony murder charge. Now they had shot him, they had stomped him to death, but they were going to give me a felony murder charge. I still didn't say anything. I was going on and open fire on y'all. They had gotten a phone call with the guy who had given the loan us the car that night who had actually set us up and I said I don't know but when Kamozi and Masai walked through the door they opened fire hmm. uh, they got off the phone just just before Masai and walked through the door when they walked through the door they started fire mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. You said that, uh, that you had a weapon in your hand and that you had put it down to uh, get help from uh, mm -hmm. Bozy, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um... They never the found... Owner, a, they oh. didn't... I never got charged with that weapon. Oh, okay. Because... Did, excuse me? Did you carry a William Carson? No, he didn't handle my... Um, um, Zod Alameen, Jared, um, uh, Jared Green at that time, Gerald X, he was in, um... Virginia. He was, um, um, Imari Obadelli was the president of the Republic of New Africa, had made contact with Zod Elmin to handle our case, but Zod had gotten carried away with this case that he was doing in Virginia, and um, he got thrown in jail. And uh, so they had told me that um, 
that when I came to court that I had to have an attorney, so I told him I was going to represent myself. Wow. And, uh, and in Virginia, the worst thing you could do at that point in the Fort Chattanooga, Virginia area was have a black attorney go in the court with you. And since we'd already taken the position that um, they had no jurisdiction to try us because, and we took the um, um, POW position, then um, there was no need for an attorney in the first place. Um, anyway, uh, the people in, in Virginia, I have to admit, they were so, they were so supportive. It, 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 was, it was really beautiful the support that the community came out with. I think, that, and it was based on the fact that we took the position that they didn't have the right to try us, that we were members of the Black Liberation Army, we gave name, rank, and serial number, and we were not going to answer any of their questions because they had no, that we were not accountable to them for anything. Uh, it wasn't immunity. It was we invoked the Geneva Convention on the on treatment of POWs. Um, but they tried us anyhow. The judge finally, after a long, um, after um, we kept taking that position, he f and he finally made rule that he had the right to try us. And um, they tried us. They had a hearing. They had uh, did the board drive, picked the jury, arraigned us, picked the jury, uh, had the trial, conviction and sentenced us all in one day. And but the real the harshest part was to me was not the trial because I expected that. It was not the sentence because I had never had an intention of doing it. Doing the time. It was not the the um the incarceration itself because, as I said, I didn't have no intentions of doing 40 years for nobody. But it was how they treated Composey. They stomped him and they, they stomped him to death. And then, to make sure there was no evidence of what they had done, they cremated him before his family got there to claim his body. And when his mother got there, they just gave him the, his clothes because they had already cremated him. So there was, it was like a total disregard. You can't do that. That's the family's responsibility. You, you tell that to. I mean, <laughs> I they did it. So right they did it. You can't do that. They did it. And then they charged us with his death. So that was that was destroyed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They. they the death penalty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for thirty days, we were facing the death penalty. And in that thirty days, they were not allowing myself and my co-defendant, my side, and one of them still alive, to communicate with each other. They wouldn't allow us to meet to build our case because, and then when they finally we finally managed to do that. They, the lawyers that they appointed to us, one, the one they appointed to me was named Barry Willis. He was a former CIA agent and a former FIA, FBI agent. Yeah. And they appointed this, this, this person and I was supposed to accept him and talk to him about me. <laughs> I didn't. Um, they assigned someone else. He was a liberal white attorney. Mass I had one too. And we used him to meet so we can talk. And they got so pissed off with us not talking to them that they said they didn't want to handle the case no more. <laughs> and they, they resigned. What they didn't understand was that we truly and firmly believed that we were POWs and they had no right to try us. And we were not, we did not fear the repercussions of what our situation was because we'd already made a conscious decision to commit our lives to the struggle for the freedom and liberation of black people. And we had already watched um, them raid the funeral of Simon Myers in New York with machine guns in the cemetery while we were burying him, jumping from behind tombstones and out of trees with submachine guns talking about this is your FBI and put your hand in the air. We had already went through the thing of, of, um, of not knowing whether we're going to live or die or come out of the cemetery in Butler, New Jersey alive. They would already did this to us. They would already um, killed Harold R Russell. And they had already killed, um, uh, uh, oh God. <laughs> uh, no, excuse me, yeah, Zay Secure. They had already killed 
uh, all, as I said, 13 other members, Sandra Pratt in California, and cut her from, and she was nine months pregnant when they, they killed her and cut her from the throat to the stomach and, 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 um, and, and, put her, and put her in a, uh, a mattress and dropped her off in the intersection in California, outside of LA and California. They'd already shot more, 28 Panthers already been killed in shootout. So we went through the fire. So we knew that one of the things, as I said, youth was something else. Because we had already, we were weaned on um, Che Guevara's statement that, that wherever death may be surprise us, it will be welcome as long as this our funeral judge be um, picked up by someone else and our and new and new people go out and 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 could carry on the struggle. So we had already been weaned on all of this. We were prepared to die in the, in the, in 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 the struggle for the liberation of black people, and they didn't understand that. They didn't understand that when they stopped Cambodia's to death, and I witnessed Cambodia's death in front of my eyes that to me death was not something to be feared. It was life and being a slave that was what to be feared. So I told him when he gave me 40 years that if it got done, his mother was going to do it. He didn't like it. He sent me to the penitentiary, <laughs> the male penitentiary, and told me to do every day of it. And I made a decision that I'd get two years, give them two years, and then I was gone. So December, December 31st, 1976, I escaped. I told him I went on a, on a uh, I called it a uh, unapproved furlough. <laughs> I went <laughs> unapproved leave. Oh, uh, anyway, we escaped. We continued to organize in prison. We continue to organize because we, we were taught that wherever we are, that the struggle is on all levels and everywhere. So wherever there are people of color, is an avenue, is a, a place to organize, you know? So we organized in prison. And we organized, we moved in prison, the, the organization moved to consolidate with all other struggling people inside the walls and organize because one of the things that had happened is that we moved so fast and the repression was so heavy that we couldn't, a lot of organizing and consolidating couldn't be done on the street. So anytime we had an opportunity to consolidate. So when, while we were we, um, forced, when we were forced into being still from, for those two years or whatever, we used it as a moment to re reinforce what we were doing to lay foundations and build foundations and write and, ex and, and um, explain to the people what we were doing and to try to educate the people to what in fact was happening um, and organize against the conditions that were going down in prison. In 19, um, after the escape, my escape, um, I was recaptured in, 1970, in March of 1977. We figured again that the most we could do back inside the wall for six months, then we could escape again. We'd give them the time to regroup and we'd escape again. Um, but then I got word from the um, other people within the army that again they made a decision that it was more important for me to um, come out so I can be above ground than for me to escape. What the institution didn't understand was that I had got my orders to come out so I can organ be in the above ground without escaping. If I had escaped, I couldn't organize in the above ground. If I came out on parole or any other way, I could organize. So I got my orders. I won't please with it because that meant I'd have to do time. I won't please at all. But as Nelson Mandela said, I'm a disciplined member of a revolutionary organization. <laughs> So I, as a disciplined member of a revolutionary organization, I had to follow orders. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't going to tell them I, that uh, I was ordered to stay inside the institution. Because if I tell them that, then they could relax. They wouldn't believe it anyhow. <laughs> they didn't believe because I told them when I came in for the first time that I had no plan. I had planned to stay two years and then leave, and they thought I was, I was crazy. They didn't believe me because I didn't break 
do a whole bunch of fights and an assault guards and every time I turned they turned around and I wasn't doing drugs or involved in homosexual activities in inside the institution that I was a model I was a model inmate, a model prisoner. That's what they thought. What they didn't understand was that I was a disciplined member of a revolutionary organization and our, and our primary objective was to establish revolutionary political power for black people. I did not have time to get involved in all that stupidity inside the prison walls that I had a job to do. They didn't understand that. They thought I was a model prisoner. So if I was as a model prisoner, I won't go and, I won't go and escape. That's the only reason I was still there because I was a model. I had already told him. I was going to be there two years and I was leaving. They didn't believe me. So when, they, when we escaped, they said, what? They said, not her, she was a model prisoner all over the news. I kept saying, I think she was a model prisoner. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, anyway, as a result of the orders, I began even working around, organizing around the family structure inside the prison, keeping mothers and children together, the parenting question, um, the long-term offenders, um, uh, the law library and other issues that in women's prisons were issues that they never dealt with. Religious freedom, the, the right to practice their religion. And those are things that inside the women's institution they never even dealt with. The kind of jobs that the women were trained to do was never dealt with. So those were issues that I got involved in inside the, the prison. The child abuse question, the uh, spousal abuse question, the question of, um, you know, working with with women who didn't have legal, legal, correct legal care and developing that whole legal apparatus inside the prison for them. Um, in the interim, they, again, they thought I was a model prisoner. I made work release in 1983 um, and made the role in August of legal care and developing that whole legal apparatus inside the prison for them. Um, in the interim, they, again, they thought I was a model prisoner. I made work release in 1983 um, and made parole in August of 83. August 27, 83, I came home on, on parole. I went, when I went before the parole board, they said to me, what was my intention? Now, there was a big dilemma about what could I say to a parole board. <laughs> now, my biggest thing I had to deal with was, because everybody told me that you had to admit guilt to a crime before you could make parole. I was not going to admit guilt to a crime. I knew I couldn't do that. Because I did not consider struggling for the liberation of black people as a crime. on the straight up. In all these years of incarceration, I never denied my political beliefs and affiliation. They were always out front. The question was how to make parole and not renounce your political beliefs and affiliation. So when this black member of the parole board asked me, what do you think of violence? I said, I don't believe in violence for the sake of violence, but everybody is capable of violence given the correct, correct conditions. And um, that violence, this, I believe in justified violence. And in violence in the, in, 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 the, in the defense of my home, my family, and my community. In my head, I'd already defined my home, my family, and my community is all black people. Yeah. So when I was able to say, so you have to, when you take a, 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 a cosmopolitan and a worldview of the situations, you can deal with them because they're not able to take that worldview. So when they were, he was thinking, my home, my family, and my community is my four-year-old daughter who I left when I went to prison and went underground, and my mother and my father and my sisters, 
And I was thinking my comrades who were killed, my co-defendant who was still doing time, all the other members of the Black Liberation Army and the members of the black community was my home, my family, and my community. And I think that's, that's the way I approach the questions that he asked me. And I was shocked to death. They also told that you had to, I had to take off my African attire, I had to unwrap my head, I had to do all of this. And I said, for eight years and eight months, some folks had watched me walk around the yard, refusing to wear a prison gown, the prison uh, attire, raising all the hell about this, and to go before a parole board, I'm gonna stop raising hell. I was not gonna do that. They would think that was a show. And I was not sincere about what I was doing. So I did not change my attire. I did not change what my beliefs. And he asked me, if you did it, if you had to do this again, would you do the same thing? I said to him, my beliefs have not changed, but the way I would have went about doing it might have changed because it have been, because now I think that what we had to do, we have to educate the people. We had to organize the people for struggle. Because, it, because the first change in our condition has to be changed. We have to make changes within ourselves. We have to kill that ego. We have to change those negative uh, things that we have in ourselves. Before we can really combine for struggle and be on move the struggle, we and internally, I was reflashing on the Battle of Algiers, when before uh, they went out to deal with the enemy, they had to go back in their community and rid their community of the drug pushers. They had to go back in their community and, and deal with the prostitutes. And they had to deal with the, the, the numbers, the, all those negative influences in their community so that when they went out and the snitchers and everybody else. So when they went out to struggle, they didn't have to worry about their back beat because they had already cleaned up their back and they had it covered. That is also how they did it in China. All successful struggles started with the internal Inter cleaning up the internal ragness. And until we deal with that, we're never going to have a successful struggle. So, we walked the yard. My, some, of my, the, some of the women that we were, were organized and who understood what I was about, we walked the yard for the next 10 days thinking, well, are you going to make it or are we not going to make it? And trying to figure out what to do if we didn't make it. And the sisters, they were so beautiful. They were thinking how to get me out. But, you know, one sister who had made parole had come back and she said, she can visit and she said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go find a weapon. I'm going to put it on the ground. And you find it and you turn it in. And they'll cut your sentence and you'll come out. You know? They, had come, they were coming up all ways to make sure that I hit the street and be able to fulfill this directive that I had to come out on the up and up. Those sisters, I'm, I'm on a very real level, they were our support, uh, in support network for me. When I had things that had to go out on, uh, on the QT that couldn't go before the, 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 through the mails, if someone was going out on furlough, they took it out for me. When we were planning our escape, if something had to go out when I was sending, I had to send things out that couldn't be left, they took it out with their possessions when they went home or because they were going home because they had maxed out. If you organize correctly where you are and build your base area, your support mechanism is right there with you. And don't say it can't be done, because it can be done. Um, and so when we got the letter that said we were going home, the Department of Corrections was shocked because they didn't believe, that they couldn't understand how I made parole. The, uh, my, my counselor really couldn't understand it because she knew that I hadn't changed. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the warden of the institution who said that I had women trying to get out of maximum security segregation and going to court to do that, she said that I couldn't be let out into maximum security segregation because I was a threat to the security of the free world. Really didn't understand how I could have got out made parole. And I tell you, honest to God, truth, I didn't understand it. So on the 22nd of August, when I walked out of the penitentiary door in Virginia, I didn't believe that I was leaving Virginia until I, my plane landed in New York and I was home. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't really believe that I was not going to end up back in prison until in November of 1988 when they released me from parole. So my mission 
during this whole time was to educate and organize. And and uh, what I want to say, as I said from the very beginning, if there's any questions about anything, if I made it seem too easy, and you know it won't easy, then you need to ask me about that. So we can talk about it. You spent 14 it. years. I spent eight years and eight months. And three years and seven months of those eight years and eight months were spent at maximum security segregation. So you came home in 82? 83. 83. Mm -hmm. You spent, uh, they, they give you, uh... A 40-year sentence. Yeah. And then they also did 21 days in the, uh... 21 days in, Matt, when, when I first went into the Virginia Correction Center for Women, they put me directly in the hole for 21 days because yeah. they said they didn't have a room, but the thing was they didn't know what to do with me. Kind of break me, too. Mm-hmm. I, I have a question, though. Your involvement with addicts, and also, I'd like to introduce Brother Akil al who is involved in the Attica Uprising. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a connection between your work with the BLA and the, and the work with Attica. At the time of Attica, I was in um, working out of the Harlem office of the Black Panther Party. I was the editor of the Right Arm Black Community News Service, the newspaper that was um, the other side of the split in the party. Our paper was Right Arm Black Community News Service. The Huey faction kept the Black Panther. Um, one of the demands that of the Brothers in Attica was asylum in a non-imperialistic country. Um, my role that was given to me was to to investigate the possibility of those non-imperialistic countries that they could be would accept them. Um, at that time, Ad um, Elders hadn't went crazy, <laughs> and. Um, he was in our international section of the Vice Panther Party. I was on the phone constantly from the time they issued that demand until they, Nelson Rockefeller issued that order to um, go into Attica for the massacre, trying to arrange that imperialist, non-imperialistic country. Uh, we had been able to, Cuba had accepted they would accept him, North Vietnam, and North Korea had said that it would accept the brothers. Um, between Algeria and Attica, that, that was my connection as an intermediary between on that last demand, non imperialism in a, and Solomon in a non imperialistic country. And um, it was like it was I don't I don't know what it's to say about that other than that the fact that they had an opportunity, they had a choice rather than kill those brothers to let them go. They wouldn't have had to to uh, put out X amount of dollars a year for to keep them in prison. And they wouldn't have had the blood on their hands. And they would have also gotten rid of them by allowing them to have that asylum. But they weren't about that. They were about what they did in Attica on September 13th. I, I think that's I think the system needs to talk about the role that the party plays in reference to the burial of uh, fallen, fallen comrades from the Attica and Dragon as well because the party plays the most role in that. You know. um, one of the things that I, uh, when I saw the film yesterday that I noticed was they had the Harlem funeral march. It wasn't a Harlem funeral march. Those caskets and that funeral was held in Brooklyn at the at Father, uh, at, at uh, Reverend Lucas, not Lucas, Daughtry's uh, Church. Um, with House of the Lord Church on Atlantic Avenue. Um, the Brooklyn chapter of the Black Panther Party, those brothers and sisters that worked out of that office, they, and they worked really, I mean, one of the things as I keep telling you about the organizing and the, and the community, the, the church, the schools, the community were organized to do the work. And we educated the community about what was going on. The connection was there and they raised the funds to buy, uh, to handle the funeral, to buy those caskets, and uh, and got donations of people who gave up the money and gave up the caskets themselves to to bury those brothers that were killed in Africa. And um, it wasn't a job for the party because those were our heroes. The party always believed that inside the prison, that when the prison doors opened, the real dragons were fired out. And those were the university of the revolution was in the prisons of America. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Well, the first question is, what is the, uh, 
the basis of the movement now? The basis is still the same. I think the primary objective remains the same is establish revolutionary political power for black people. One of the things that I know personally that we are trying to do, the party, the, the black movement is so factionalized, it's ridiculous. There's so many different, everybody wants to be the leader, and we're going nowhere because our, and we're, we're dying, and by leaps and bounds, our, we're losing our youth and everything else. The prisons are overflowing with us, women and children and men. So, and, and all this internal contradictions between organizations is leaving the people out there with nowhere to go. So one of the things that are those of us who are sincere about struggle, about turning this whole mess around, our objective, our primary objective, our immediate objective is to try to deal, so do something about this, this factionalism, is to come together in some form of unity and organize it so that we can collectively move forward and come back and deal with organizing our people toward our freedom. To see that we're not annihilated within the next ten years. Yeah, right yes. Sir. It's not easy. It's not easy. It never said it was gonna be yeah, easy. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I mean, uh, what you talk, what you talk about? I was, I was never in the Republican Party. Yeah. 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 We're in the joint, we're trying to, uh, to get it out of it. It's so mixed up out here now, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's you difficult. know, but you know one of the things that I've learned, and I've watched from watching other folks, the reactionaries, and it got to start in the home. You know, we neglect that home yeah. thing a lot, but we, they teach their children to hate us from the dinner table, oh, from, the, right. from the crib. Oh. We have to start teaching our children from the crib, at the dinner table. That we never again, the Jews, after, after the Germany, after the six million of them were killed in the Holocaust, they said never again. And look what they, where they're at now. Uh, Over 30, 40 million of us was killed in the Middle Passage. We, the Black Holocaust. Demanding 10 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Demanding 10 billion dollars. Yeah. Right. 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 But, we, but we can't the keep, cities are falling apart. look, but we can't keep denigrating them for doing what they do to keep themselves alive. What we have to do is learn from them and take right. that same position ourselves and say, never again will we be six million of us ain't gonna die no more. And for every one of us to die, somebody's gonna pay. Right. And we've gotta stop doing rash actions and build foundations to move. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of struggle struggles going on right now. Uh, actually the revolution never really died. Like you say, mm -hmm. it just has been slowed it's down a lot through infiltration uh, and they equip that um, materialism. This is a war of materialism that we're going through right now. Individualism, <laughs> materialism, economics, and uh, significant uh, 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 like yourself and the brother there. They really want to keep you out of the forefront. You know, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, people like us dwelling here. They don't want us to inform. The information is what they want to, they, they want to keep down, you know. Uh, you know what? We don't have to necessarily have to be in the forefront. What we need to do is we can meet like this and talk. That's the best and, and then we can meet like this and talk, mm -hmm. and then you can talk to somebody else. Yeah. And we organize like that, because yeah. every time we go before the media and talk, yeah, that's the then we, 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 the we, the we well, what happens to the revolution, revolution will not be televised, right. mm -hmm. you know? We keep going, we have to have a press conference to tell them what we're going to do. That's right. We don't need that. We don't need that. We need to struggle. We need to struggle. You know? The other thing we have to do, I, I, you know, and I, you know, I don't, you know, I say, I say, is we have to stop looking at a person because they're black and they're in these elected positions and every time they do something wrong, we don't say nothing about it because they're black. The overseers on the plantations were black. Right. Yeah. And the white man can't get close enough to you to know it, so they gotta send a black person in there to look like you to get close to you to find out what you gonna do. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. so we can't keep dealing with them folks who selling us out because they're black. They are brothers and our sisters. And yeah, they got them working. Well, as, as, as the Marshall said, there's, there's no difference between a white snake and a black snake. A snake is a snake. Fight. You know, and they're, they're about to appoint, in my opinion, another black snake to the Supreme Court. Hopefully. 
And that's why I don't think it's just a, a racial struggle, it's also a class struggle. Yeah. I mean, amongst black people, uh, the people in, the, in that upper middle class and whatnot, they think like white people. A lot of them, you know what I'm saying? They got the class distinctions, the upper middle class, it's, it's based on money, basically. Mm -hmm. Over from 50 to 125,000 is and that's you know, up middle class, you know, and over that you in the higher class, and between 20 and 50, you in the lower middle class, and below that you in the lower class, and then they got the economic underclass. Well, all those people have different uh, insights, different perspectives, you know what I'm saying, even in the black community. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, get, be able to be conscious enough to know what we're dealing with. And once you understand what we're dealing with, because of who it is. If they're wrong, they're wrong. If right. I'm wrong, then you're supposed to check me. You're right. You're right. And if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. right. We have to stay in tune, stay in tune, uh, especially with the new world order, because uh -huh. it's uh, an addition of the old world. Old world. And the order never changed. You can't, <laughs> <get nobody, laughs> can't get nobody no respect that don't respect you. Uh, I, I, yes, I have a question. Um, what can we do concretely to respect POWs now? There are, I'm not really aware of a number of black organizations in Chicago that are dealing with POWs. I don't know of a company of white, but as black people, what can we, what can we, what kind of support can we lend, what is needed from our end to that end, and, you know, from, from real, um, you talking about the guy's money? Well, I, what? All, everything. What is it? Um, um. I, mean, I think there's two things. That, um, there's a short range thing and a long range thing. Um, the short range thing we can do is we begin to talk to people about them. We can begin to write to them. We begin not, you know, we can get, uh, uh, find out what they need and begin to deal with those things. Sometimes just as much as books to read because they can't get that. A letter that uh, comes in every day that talks about what's happening in your community, that talks about, you know, so they can see that there's a world going out there and somebody cares about what happens to them. On the long range things, we need to develop our own legal defense fund. We need to um, and put that economic, because we can't keep depending on liberal white lawyers yeah. to volunteer their services to defend us. Because a lot of times their agenda is not our agenda. No, and a lot of times, even even if we get the black, uh, black lawyers to do it, People are not going to get the best defense unless they get the dollars. Yeah. And if you're paying, they're going to give the best. They're going to give you're going to get what you pay for. We have to build that whole legal defense fund in our community so that when our people, when they're struggling, regardless of what level you're struggling on, somebody's going to go to jail. If you're doing enough organizing in the housing movement and you're organizing, you're organizing too strong, then you can go to jail for organizing in the, uh, the tenant movement. You can go to jail for educating and they get they tired of what you say in the community. Yeah. So you need to deal, you know, we need our own legal defense funds. And we need to, those brothers and sisters who are in law school to be educated so they can come out and as part of the movement be le be, be the lawyers we need there. On the on the final thing, you know, even if there's not like this no organization here, in whatever little affiliation you have, we need to build coalitions, we need to build United Front. We need to build those movements. And we don't have to, it don't have to be uh, 30 or 40 of us to start. You can start with one or two. Right. That's what you call the country. Right? Yes. Right. As long as you're working. If it's about work, you can do it with two or three. If it's about bullshitting, then you need 10 or 20 or 30 to do it. This is serious. It's something to take in heart. Yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, you all are now organized. In the Black Panther Party does not exist as the Black Panther Party anymore. Okay. We do believe that in order for us to move our struggle forward, there's a need for a political party. Together we can build a party. But in the interim, Panthers are out there. And people who are committed to struggle are out there. So uh, this is a political party. No, these are political people that we're speaking of. Yeah. Yes. I have, in terms of uh, kind of more linking to the question the sister asked, um, what you are doing now in, in, in the community 
terms of speaking out and writing your book about post uh, post traumatic stress and so on. And also, uh, what I wonder if Brother Akil could uh, elaborate on the community organizing that he's doing in the community now. So. Well, let me let me let me take responsibility for something else and, and similar to what you raised. See, I think that the question that you raised, Sister, and I accept the answer that was given by the Sister Sophia, I think that she hit it on the point. But in addition to that is what is happening is that there's a brother who's a member of the Black, that is a former member of the Black Panther Party by the name of uh, Daruba Ben Wahad. And uh, he's been going throughout the country speaking on behalf of political prisoners and prisoners of war here in the United States of America. Since his release, he's been going to the various prisons, meeting with brothers and, and sisters in the joint, particularly brothers, right, because that's mostly who are there. And there's a serious effort being made to form a black organization that just addresses that question. My suggestion would be is what you do is keep in contact with the sister who's in contact with that brother. And when things are more formulated and structured, you'll know and you'll be able to tie in to that. But in the interim, do the things that the sister has suggested. Uh, you ask what I'm doing in Brooklyn. Uh, I work with an organization that's called a Community Self-Defense Program. And it's a cadre-based organization as well as a mass organization. We have two components. We have a component that's economic development. It's called Chocolate Chip. And that's a collective of people who are involved in word processing and computers. What we do with that is we try to bring uh, technology into the black community uh, at a reasonable rate. I'm not too much involved in that area of work. I'm involved more in the community self-defense part of the program. What do we do in the community self-defense program? One, we teach people how to run meetings. We teach people how to write proposals. We have a program that's called Black August, and Black August stem from brothers out in California. Our Black August is geared towards the youth, the Black August Youth uh, Summer Program. When the school is ended in June up until September, what we do is we either have brothers and sisters in the community come and teach the children so that they don't lose whatever they have been learning between June and September, plus we provide them with a proper, what we consider to be a proper formal education because we introduce them to black history, all right? That's one thing. We also, in the fall, when school starts from September until June, we have what's called a homework helper program. On Mondays and Thursdays, we go into Fort Greene Senior Citizen Center and the children that are involved in our program that's within a 26 block area, we, we, we bring them to the center and we take care of, we go through their homework with them and then we escort them from the center back to their homes. We also uh, bring into the community uh, acupuncturists uh, because, you know, like a lot of our people suffer from hypertension, right, or arthritis, rheumatism, diabetes. So we bring in acupuncturists and we bring in uh, uh, people involved in acupressure as well. And they provide health care for people that go to that center, particularly for Green City Citizen Center. Uh, we also teach the senior citizens Tai Chi Tuan, which is a Chinese form of health and self-defense. Bring that to our people. 
we teach the general popu or the general community. We have people come in to another center, all right, and teach this as well to the general uh, community. We also have a self-defense program where we train people both in armed and un unarmed training. We teach people how to uh, conduct themselves at demonstrations. We provide security for most of the left forces within the city of New York. We also are involved in anti-crack campaigns. All right. Uh, we set up tenant patrols. We teach people how to set up tenant organizations. So some of the social ills that affect our people that we can address them without having to call on the man to deal with our problems. Those are some of the things that, and we also are, are in contact, we correspond and send literature, and in some cases, monies to brothers who are in prison throughout the country, but particularly those brothers who are in prison in the state of New York. Those are some of the things that the Community Self-Defense Program does in Brooklyn, New York. And we've been doing that from like around August of 1983 up until right now. This is September 22nd. Like that at all, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're working on it. Right. We're working on it. But again, see, as the sister said, wherever we are at, right. all right, we have the ability to organize. It's important for us to get direction from other brothers and sisters, but the thing about it is once, wherever we are, once we know that conditions are a certain way, then we need to just assume the responsibility to deal with it. And it's, it's, it's laborious work. It's never easy. But she said, if you got three people who are serious about getting down, you can get down. If you're looking for 30 people, then usually you don't get too much done because you got to deal with all the different contradictions that's involved. So just in some cases, a small cell or cadre can be more effective in organizing our folk as opposed to a large amount of people who tire things done. But wherever we are at, we're capable of organizing. You can, if you live in, 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 in a tenement uh, situation, or if you live in a housing project, there's your base right there. It's harder to organize people who live, uh, who we call uh, home dwellers, right? Because people own their own homes, you know, like basically a lot of things are, are, are settled. They don't have certain contradictions that other people have, or, you know, that they have to worry about. So if you live in, 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 in apartment buildings or you live in housing projects, you got the people right there. You just have to find the people whom you feel that you can trust and are willing, who think the same way that you think, quote, and, and are willing to move in the same direction that you're willing to move in and has the same purpose that you have then you can go on and move and be successful. Don't wait for no big stars to come around and do it because, as she mentioned before, a lot of people come out to do work when the cameras are around, but after the cameras are gone, then they go and do something else. You know, and I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the negative, I'm saying that when the camera ain't around, they don't be around. When the camera's around, they're around because it allows for people to see their faces and it kind of like validate or substantiate to the masses that these are people who are taking care of business. Yeah. And, and, and the, the brothers and sisters who, who strive daily to help lessen our burden behind are behind the scenes. You never hear about those brothers and sisters, but the fact of the matter, those are the most important uh, element of our of, of, of our organizers to gain our liberation Absolutely. in the United States of America. So that's all I need to say I think on that.